Uh, we're going to dig right in. As Michael said, we had actually 112 questions come in. Uh, we've organized those into five categories. We're going to touch on those themes. Um, and initially, I want to give some overview stats on this topic, and then Kevin has some comments to make as well, and then we'll address those categories um, and as go for about uh, 40, 45 minutes. And then um, if you have other questions, you can put them in chat and we, we might uh, take a few questions from the group. And as indicated, uh, all the questions we get, we're going to respond to and, and, um, and, and get those back to you. In addition to uh, the books, if you ask a question, um, Michael's going to send out a form for your addresses, and if for some reason you don't get you don't get your book, I'll give you my email address to contact me directly. Also, I indicated that uh, I I do a webinar about every month, and, and and Kevin as well. So if you've gotten our books, uh, you you certainly can request another one of my my books, and I'll send that. Uh, one that you don't have. I've, I've done 31 books, so um, we can do that as well. Uh, so uh, the hybrid work work environment, here we are. <laughs> it was always coming and then it came and now we're in the aftermath, okay? Uh, and so I just wanted to frame our conversation with a couple comments about uh, the stats on, on this, the to uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so during the pandemic, 42% of the workforce were working from home. Um, everyone that, that could did, the essential workers couldn't, but it was the, the norm during the, the pandemic. Um, of, of those people that worked at home, 61% said, darn, they wanna keep working from home or remotely indefinitely. Uh, so that was going into uh, where we're at now. There's a high expectation. Hey, this worked. This worked for me. And, and uh, hopefully it worked for the company. A lot of research indicates that um, working remotely uh, can be uh, as productive or more productive. One of the issues that kind of came up um, and, and that we'll talk about. And so um, we're now at the point where 40% of employers are now asking people to come back to the office. Okay, and this is all shapes and sizes. A Apple asked people to come back uh, at least three days a week, either back in the office or time spent at at uh, at physical meetings, uh, off sites, that type of thing. Um, I just worked with Microsoft. They have asked everyone to come back five days a week. So um, you got the whole this whole spectrum there, and uh, of course, there's there's some companies that are are going the other direction fully being remote. 50% of U.S. workers report that they can do their job completely, 100% remotely. Okay, so that's what's in their heads, especially if they've done it. They want to keep doing that for the most part. Not everyone, but uh, for the most part. 32% actually indicate um, that uh, not only do they want to work from home permanently, but darn, they will quit if they're not allowed to. So something to keep in mind. It's, it's easy to bring the hammer down and say everyone will be back in work, but then you got to live with the consequences and and those people that really want to still do that and know that they can, uh, they'll likely go find a different job. So uh, that's one of our discussion points. And and right now there's 16% of companies that are fully remote and 44% allow no remote, remote work at all. So, and I, I think this, uh, and I'd be interested in your, your comments on this, Kevin. I, I think this this generally relates to um, outside the population centers. If you're from, a, you know, not a, a major metro area, that, uh, and I know Michael is in Dallas, and they never during the pandemic they still had people come in. So uh, that's the spectrum, um, and we'll see where you fit in in that and how to decide the best way going forward. Kevin, you want to add any other stats uh, that are are relevant to framing this conversation? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I, I was, I've been chuckling the last couple of years about the fact that I wrote my book, The Virtual Manager, right on the heels of my first book, was, which was Building a Magnetic Culture. And I, the reason I've been chuckling is that people 
you know, suddenly when the pandemic hit, you had all these people that were trying to figure out remote work. And when they looked at the date on the book that Dr. Bob is giving you, um, I wrote it 15 years ago. So a lot of my friends and family were like, are you prescient? How did you know? It's like, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to claim that I knew, but the origin of the book actually came from the fact that largely because of the changing uh, generations in the workforce, uh, a lot of the, uh, the younger workers, especially millennials, were questioning the model of why do we have to go to an office when we can work from home? And so I began getting more and more requests as an HR consultant when I ran my old company, HR Solutions, for like, is there evidence that this makes sense? And that was the origin of why I wrote the book, because it made more and more sense to have workplace flexibility, which younger workers prize. Now, Dr. Bob was talking about the uh, what I call the wrestling match between companies that want workers coming back into the office and workers wanting to stay at home. That wrestling match is still going on. And I actually did a blog that was a very... Um, widely circulated that the the number one reason people wanted and i'll ask you this dr bob if you were to cite the number one reason that the remote worker wanted to stay at home what would be your guess well autonomy flexibility no commute <laughs> would be in the in the top uh, guesses. Those, those are all on the list, Dr. Bob. The, the, but the number one reason people wanted to work from home? Fido, the family pet. Yeah, the greatest okay. beneficiary of this pandemic were the family pets. He's like, oh, let's go for another walk. So they, when, when we polled people about why they want to work, I mean, they, there was a whole new relationship that they had with the family pet. And... Uh, so that was uh, just absolutely fascinating. And this struggle Everyone support the animal. Match, it's still going on. If any of you have senior managers that have still not bought off on the, pro <clears throat> on the benefits of allowing out of office work and the benefits of working from home, then feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to share that blog with you. It's a blog I wrote on how to convince those old school managers to become fervent believers in remote work. And I'd be happy to uh, to send you that blog if you- And that's that's actually one of the category of questions that we, we got, so we will we will address that. And then I'd, I'd love to see that blog as well. Let me, let me just uh, forward this to uh, uh, some slides you gave me, uh, Kevin, and, and uh, you can speak to them uh, about the proven benefits of virtual work. Yeah, it's beneficial not only for employers, but also for employees. And what, what are the main attributes for employers? It makes it much easier to attract and retain top talent, especially younger workers. You have much more satisfied customers because you now have 24-7 worldwide customer service. Um, obviously, it's good for the environment, which again, millennials uh, care a lot about reducing the carbon footprint. It's been proven that it's higher productivity, re reduced absenteeism, and of course, employers do not have to spend a lot of money on real estate costs because they're letting their people work from home. From the employee perspective, they have much greater flexibility and control, which uh, you know, Gen Z and Gen X prize greatly. So it makes it a lot easier to attract and retain uh, that, uh, those generations of top talent. There's less stress and less burnout. I mean, we've all been in the car commuting and trying to fight traffic, and it's very, very stressful. You're able to have a better work-life balance. Um, a lot of these younger generations also prize health and wellness. So if you're working from home, you literally can jump on the treadmill and, with your headset on and continue working, but also get some good exercise in. And there are cost savings. So you're going to avoid high gas prices and transportation fares. So those are just some of the benefits. 82% <clears throat> of the Fortune 100 best places to work have allowances and policies allowing for work from home. I mean, what makes great companies great? <clears throat> Workplace flexibility. 
So that's one of the metrics that you could share with people who are not current believers in working from home. 81% of employees who have worked remotely report that they have higher productivity when than when they went into a company website. And you know the greatest thief of productivity on a company um, company headquarters? It's interruptions. The average number of interruptions per employee per day is 60. Those in, in a workplace conversations, what did you do last night? Did you hear so-and-so is dating so-and-so? That costs a lot of productivity. Excellent. Virtual workers, it's been proven, put in more hours. So one of the biases that old school managers have is, oh, if they're working from home, you know, they're not really working. And that is actually opposite of the truth. It's been proven by Gallup, one of my former competitors, uh, when I did the ubiquitous employee engagement surveys, um, proved that people that are working from home put more hours of work in each week. And if you know someone that you, maybe your partner at home who works from home, watch their habits. They roll out of bed, they don't get changed, they go to their computer in the pajamas and they get to work. In fact, I, I saw one study, Kevin, that had this as high as 17 virtual employees work as much as 17 hours more uh, per week, uh, which I, I initially thought oh, that can't be true. But my, my wife's a virtual employee and let me tell you, when when we're not eating or or watching a movie or something, she's working. So that's wow. uh, late at night. That's uh, any place in the house. That's uh, and and that's uh, people that are committed. That's what they do. They they are they want to do the work. And uh, with less distractions, as you indicated, it's, it's easier to dig in. Absolutely. And then in terms of employee engagement, which I'm passionate about. Um, this data, I think the, the most up-to-date Gallup data shows that out-of-office workers have, are, are more engaged than in-office workers, and those are the two metrics, 32 versus 28%. And again, that makes sense because they've got, you know, work is part of life. Work is not life in it, itself. So people that, that um, you know, want to get the flexibility to do other things, and that could be that could be their wash. That could be, you know... And, and why is that a problem for someone to take a break and throw their wash in? You know, it's, it's uh, I, I, I know uh, New York finance companies have, have led the charge in getting people back to work. I remember one CEO said, I don't want you doing your laundry during working hours. It's like, well, why? <laughs> you know, that really makes no sense. And another CEO said, if you can go out to eat, for dinner in New York City, you can come to the office. And it's like, well, okay, I guess if you're paying people enough, you can force them to do anything, but is that really, that's not the reality of where things stand now and where we're headed. So you, you gotta you gotta pick and choose in this in this battle, uh, or, or maybe battle's the wrong term, but you've gotta, you've gotta choose what are we gonna allow and, and what's the system we wanna do it. Well, that relates to a lot of the questions that we got were, we're asking about how do we monitor employees? How do we monitor these remote workers? And the reality is these people do not want to be monitored. You should, you know, not just <laughs> look at the outcomes. What outcomes are you getting? Are you getting the outcomes that you wanted or exceeding the outcomes? And if they're doing the wash and getting the outcomes, who cares? Yes, it's, it's got to be based on the performance you want from them. And and any other metric is is going to be secondary. Are they getting the job done as they said they would in the time frames required? Yes. And if not, and I, I had a long conversation with my wife about this because in in the she's a high tech and in the high tech environment, agile workplace, she does a whole scrum thing where it is high accountability. It's not like people are off doing whatever the hell they want. It's like they have a a 15 minute morning meeting. Who, who, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? What challenges do you have? They have strategies for connecting during the day. They have a uh, high accountability. In fact, uh, if, if you don't make, uh, you know, since the whole thing's based on connecting, if you don't make the connection meetings every morning uh, without excuse, like you, you just forgot about it, <laughs> you do that, you did that once, twice at most, and you're fired. Because if, if we can't agree to work a certain way together, then it's not going to work here. So you've got so much going on that work is secondary to you. 
go work somewhere else, but they have high accountability and, and using uh, technical tools to make that happen for everybody. Um, well, and you, you touched upon the other thief of productivity, Bob, which is meetings. And I just recently did a blog about you know, how many employees are sitting in meetings saying, why am I in this meeting? This is a complete waste of my time. And I give tips on how to eliminate those meaningless meetings uh, yeah. in that blog on my my uh, my website, which is, uh, yeah. It'll Excellent. Be and and the, having the, the, the idea of having standing meetings, ah, uh, boy, I, I think, like you said, it, it's got to be, um, is the person necessary for this meeting, then they're invited and they're expected to, to be actively involved. If they're not, let them go focus on what they got to focus on. But just to have everyone meet so that I could be the manager, it, it's out of, out, of, out of sync with the times. Uh, so let me, let me uh, before we approach some of these, these categories, let me just ask you, Kevin, what, what is, with all the evidence that we have that this actually works, and why, what do you think is going on with the, uh, of why so many managers and executives are against it? And I will, I will quote just one, one line from your book, The Virtual Manager, uh, and that, and that said that, uh, that uh, at the heart of it, most managers are uncomfortable with, with, uh, if I can't see the people, I don't know they're working. Is that really the, the main thing that's hanging us up or are there other, other things that are uh, keeping companies from, from um, going with this, uh, with both feet? That's definitely one of the main, um, main issues uh, regarding, you know, allowing for remote and hybrid work. Uh, it's the issue of uh, can I trust? And a lot of the times the managers that are not embracing hybrid work, they are uh, not doing so because they hired the wrong people. So a large part of building a magnetic culture in a truly best in class uh, engaged culture is making sure you hire the right people. And so, you know, if you, when you interview them, uh, you want to ask them questions that will see whether you can trust them. So my favorite question is to give them a couple softball questions and then uh, give them this, what might one of my favorite interview questions is, can you share with me, you're asking this of a candidate that's interviewing, what is the greatest single mistake that you've made in the last three years in your job? Nine out of 10 people will not answer that question because they're afraid to show what they did wrong. The people that you want to hire is, are the ones that will answer that question by saying, well, this will be easy. I, you know, two months ago, I you know, had a pretty big mistake and here were the uh, results of it. And these are the measures I put in place to ensure that it could never happen again. So hire the right people. So you're saying that that's one a thing you can screen for your trustworthiness in terms of their their willingness to be authentic and to admit uh, when they've they've made errors and and how they've learned from those. That's exactly right. And the other best practice tip is seeing have they done remote work before and what were the outcomes, and ask them for the references that can validate that they were indeed a very successful hybrid worker or remote Excellent. worker. Well, let's this, uh, this look at some of these categories of questions that we, we got in. And and some on some of these, we had a lot of questions, you know, so I'll, I'll call out when it's especially uh, a lot of energy towards it. So a virtual remote worker issues, um, we got uh, questions from, um, and you already mentioned uh, uh, productivity, which we both feel is, can be, as good or better with remote employees, uh, monitoring software, and there's a lot of software uh, that you can monitor. Uh, and about just about 50% from my stats, 50% of employees use some type of monitoring software. And and uh, again, this is a chicken and egg thing because I wouldn't start with, <laughs> we're going to monitor everyone because we don't trust you. But uh, it, it's more, uh, we're, we're going to trust you but we're going to monitor to to uh, validate. Uh, we're going to trust, but we're going to validate. And you, you, there's software that you can monitor keystrokes, uh, what's printed, what websites are viewed, uh, if they're online or not. 
et cetera, et cetera. So if you have a, you know, it's a, one of the ways that you, you I, I feel if you have a manager that doesn't believe in this, you know, you have a discussion. You say, what would it take for you to trust me to work remotely? Do you want me to check in multiple times during the day? You want you know, my cell phone number? You want me to have an open chat line? Do you, you know, what, do you want me to log my time and end of the day, give you a report? Tell me what would, it's, it, if the employee wants to do it, what does the manager need to feel confident and good about it? I think that's a very uh, real conversation that you should have if you're having resistance from, from leadership because say, what would it take? And it's really more working with the trust issue of the manager to uh, be allowed to, uh, okay, I, I can, I can trust, I can go with this if these things happen. If, you know, if uh, when I call you answer the phone, you know, or, or uh, you, if, you know, if uh, I, I mean, I had one, you know, because we're, we're you know, you, the, we're looking to make sure people don't abuse it. I had one virtual employee and someone told me every time they called her, she was at Costco. You know, well, that's an indication that that maybe if she getting the job done, eh, maybe yes, maybe no. If if her priority is like, hey, it's free time every day, I can do whatever the hell I want, and uh, that that would indicate maybe maybe she needed a little bit more more uh, you know controls to to keep to keep her honest, you know. Um, and um, so you know, the best... I had to let that person go. By the way, so yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Well, the best practice on this is define the outcomes up front. What are the outcomes you want achieved? And as long as you're getting those, if she's at Costco, great. If she's yeah. achieving the outcomes you predefined, so what? Let her be at Costco. Yeah, and maybe that's she, she takes her break time to go to Costco for you know for a quick run. And and again, in that context, that's perfectly okay. And and uh, uh, it, it's okay if people get the job done. It's okay for them to have uh, to get there a different way. And of course, as as you know, there's some people are are better morning people. Uh, others are better at night. I'm 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 uh, for one a, a night owl. My wife is is up at that gets up at five thirty, you know, and and loves that. And so uh, allow people to work when they can work best and what what works with their rhythms. I think that's that's part of all this as well. Um, so uh, other questions that that came in um, again. Um, and we touched on this earlier, convincing resistant managers to support remote and hybrid work. Uh, again, I, I, I feel part of that is to deal with their trust issues and what would they need to, to feel confident and not just blindly trust, you know. Uh, other thoughts you have on that, Kevin? Yeah, a lot of the questions were re regarding, you know, the, the number of people. Um, how many people are working remotely and how often? And the statistics that I had, some of which are in my book, The Virtual Manager, is that currently there are 4.7 million uh, remote, work, remote workers that are working at, from home at least 50% of the time. Interestingly enough, back to that trust issue, still today, despite all the evidence that remote work makes sense, uh, some of the time at least 44% of uh, all organizations do not allow for remote or hybrid work. Um, 64% of remote workers yeah. are remote full-time, which is interesting. And 28.2% of remote workers are part of the hybrid model, sometimes going into the office and sometimes working from home. Yeah, so really pick, pick your path there, uh, that combination and I have, uh, my son uh, works for a company that's, that's fully remote, and I talked to him a lot about you know, how that's going, and, and does he miss the office? And no. And does he miss connection with people? Yes. And how, how does he accommodate that? I said, well, they do meetups. He lives in Seattle, and they do a meetup for all employees for his company that want to go to the NFT museum or to go to a ball game or meet you know, in, the, in the park, you know. Uh, they do different things. And so you can accommodate those connection needs that I think we all have, um, you know, and depending on where you are in your career, that might be more important for younger employees. They they want more of that connection, more visibility with management, more face time with their own manager. Uh, someone that's, that's been the job longer, they might, you know, the way you trust them is to let them do their job and, and stay out of their hair. You know, they don't want to spend a lot of time talking to their manager. Trust I can do the job, you know, that type of thing. So 
Um, I, I think exactly. again, you, you need to vary it with the people you've got. Um, let's see. Do you have any, uh, let's see, just looking at the different categories of questions here. Uh, how how do you recommend best having employees feel included and informed from your experience, Kevin? Included in what? And informed to be to you know, to be a part of the company to be informed of what's going on, to be included in decisions. Uh, that this this is one of the concerns of you know a lot of people that are working remote. They feel they're in an outpost and they're out of sight, out of mind, and. Uh, you know, how do we how do we make sure that they're they're included as much as we need them to or as much as they want to be? So several things that should be happening. Number one, have regularly scheduled um, staff meetings, but make sure that the staff meeting has a clear agenda that's distributed in advance so people know what the meeting is going to be about and it can be run more efficiently. In addition, each manager should have at a minimum a weekly one-on-one uh, -on -one chat with their direct reports, ideally, if these people are remote, via Zoom, so they can actually see the person, see their face, as opposed to just a phone call. It's much, much more effective. And those one-on-ones should be about the employee and their questions and their issues and help that they need, not a chance just to dump more work on the person. It's got to be exactly right. come from and, their perspective. Um, the dialogue during those meetings should be like, Okay, how was your week at work? Um, when did you feel the most engaged during the last week? And why was that? What, what got you to be most engaged? And then during the week, did you experience anything that you found disengaging or adding to uh, potential job dissatisfaction? And what can I do about it? So let the person communicate, and, but also realize that not all employees are going, going to be comfortable being honest, especially about the negatives in their job with their direct manager, especially if they have a somewhat tenuous relationship with the manor, manager. This underscores the need for a confidential way that employees can give feedback to their manager and the organization. Um, you could set up a, a chat line, if you will. And of course, having run a company that did the confidential employee engagement surveys for 35 years, I'm a big believer. Allow employees to take a regular, ideally an annual employee engagement survey that gives them a means to give conf confidential feedback about all of the workplace topics, and especially the most important one, which is their relationship with their manager. And you know, when I wrote my, my other bestseller, Building a Magnetic Culture, I actually had a statistician, I said, I want you to run all the data from all the people that we've surveyed in the last three years and show me what's the number one driver of engagement. And of course, Dr. Bob knows it's recognition. Number two driver is career advancement, but the number three driver is the relationship with the manager. But when you look at the top three, of course, and you see recognition at the top, who is the person that should be saying thank you? It's the manager. Who's the yep. person that say, hey, I want to have a conversation with you about your career development, and I want to help you advance to your career. It's the manager. So the top three drivers of employee engagement are all related to the manager. Just on, on that career development issue, because one of the, the perceived shortcomings of virtual workers is they don't have the visibility in the organization. They're not being upper management. And you can address that. And I, I've seen one of the best practices I'm seeing with companies is they do skip level meetings. Once a quarter, you're allowed to meet with your manager's manager to discuss your career. Gives you visibility, gives you a, a, a chance to have a dialogue and to plant the seed of where you want to go and, and how the organization can help support that. So I think we have to be, we have to reach out and do new things to make that, uh, give people that sense of, uh, uh, connection to the culture and to the bigger organization and to opportunities for advancement. Let me let me go to the next category here on on of course a lot of stuff came up on in office worker issues and um, again um, and the, the the big one being 
uh, why why are managers so insistent on and executives insistent on having people come back? And I, we touched on this initially, but also just sort of the things like, you know, I, I, what I'm seeing, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of silly, a little bit frustrating, but if you got to come in, you, you've got a, a building, you know, uh, or you've got a, a lease and an empty office, you feel like, well, this isn't right. We got to get people back here. So you got to ha- instead bridge the conversation of, well, maybe we should sublease or maybe we should sell the building, you know, and go to a WeWork uh, uh, location to give people the option to to leave their home and connect. Um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, the other thing, I, like I heard that um, in, in the last uh, number of months that, that Biden was was uh, coming out, he was getting pressure to like in D.C., you know, downtown restaurants are closing because there's no workers, you know, to go get lunch. And so uh, he's coming down to, you know, have government employees come to work. And I, I think, you know, I, I think those are like the tail wagging the dog. If fundamentally work has changed, you know, we have to deal with the new reality and not cling to saying, well, we, you know, we're used to having people in the office, so we need to get back to that. And I think that's what we're in right now. But I, I think you can see right now about 50, 54 percent of, of commercial real estate is vacant. And, and downtown San Francisco, the lot, largest building downtown, Salesforce is, is mainly empty. You know, And so uh, we, we need to just realize that, that times have changed and we need to adjust that going forward. And ideally, from my perspective, and I think yours as well, Kevin, is is you need to have the 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 focus of the target employee because if we can if we can wrap around what they need um, and still get the company's needs done, that's what it's all about. I, my definition of engagement is to is to combine um, individual aspirations with corporate uh, objectives. And if you if you get the focus on both of those, then you'll have motivated employees and you get the job done as well. It, it, we're not going back to the 1920s where where it's just uh, whatever the company wants, the company gets because employees have too many options today. I've got, if anyone wants it, I've got a 25 page list of companies that hire um, remote employees. And so if it's not working where you're at, uh, you know, you should certainly look around. Uh, Other in in office, uh, in-person work issues, um, from your perspective, Kevin, um, there's a lot of questions were about how do we get, Employees excited about coming back to work, you know, that the company said we, we were going to move in this direction, whether it's a one day or three days or something. How do we get them excited about coming in and not not have it just be a, a, a drag with the commute and, and now they're, they're doing something that they didn't have to do for, for three years kind of thing. And I, I don't know, I, I like to think that if you have a, you know, if you have a party and no one comes, it's not much of a party. And likewise, if it's if you come into, you know, my wife came in the office for, and she said it's like she here she'd been working for with the team for a year on Zoom, and now she's at the office and they're sitting around the same table. That's you know w- why are we doing this again? And and one person's coughing, you know, so, <laughs> and and she just got more resi- resistant to saying, yeah, it's not working for me. I I, I don't I, thank you. And and they tried to bribe people with offering food. Of course, she's vegan. They never have anything for her. You know, it's sort of. If you have to bribe people to come to the office, then it's probably you're missing something. It's like you need to wrap more around uh, them and the job that needs to be done um, together, but not just the, the mechanics of it's got to be from the office. I, you know, having someone you have to be in the office, have to be in the office eight thirty. You can probably force that to happen, but then they're going to be gone by four if they still stay in, with that job. You know, I think the reality is there's enough people that have seen this work or work for them too that that they want to uh, they want to keep this as a permanent uh, fixture in their in their um, work life um, well one of the great ways of getting people to come back to the office is to not make it all about work and you know as um, part of the teachings on employee engagement the missing driver of engagement in a lot of workplaces is a three-letter word fun bring fun back into the workplace, you know, have people come in and say, Hey, we're going to have a pizza party, have a pizza party. You know, employees also like to get to know their coworkers. So encourage them to come back in the office and have one-on-ones with their coworkers and share their best practices, make fun as part of the onboarding process. We used to have a 
whenever we had a new employee start at my company, we would get everyone together and say, well, part of our onboarding process is that you need to stand on the conference room table and sing your favorite song. And of course, the new employee was you know, horrified thinking that they would have to stand up and sing their song on the conference room table. And then we'd let them know we were just kidding, but everyone would laugh then. Yeah, until you got a lawsuit. Okay, but yeah, that's 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 kind of fun. But uh, you know, and again, it's fun. It's not just come to to work to have party, but you work it into you. You celebrate successes. When we met goals again in this in the agile uh, sprint work environment, uh, they work for two weeks. Where a lot of companies use this, uh, and two weeks and at the end of that, you debrief. And then you do a team building thing. And, and then you bring in a pizza, you know, so you work the fun and the celebration and the getting to know each other into the appropriate times um, during during the, the workflow. Uh, and I, I think that that's, uh, says a lot about uh, what, what could work. Now, you know, another I, thing that I ahead. saw companies do and if people want samples of these videos is making a workplace happiness video. Get senior managers to be part of the video. You know, pick a favorite song that's popular and make a a workplace happiness video. Um, those work really, really well. Uh, thank you. And, and, you know, my latest book is Work Made Fun Gets Done. So <laughs> I'm in complete agreement with everything you're saying. And and if you don't have that book and you want that, then then uh, let me know as well. Um, other, other hybrid issues, you know, several people asked about uh, should uh, new employee orientation be different in the hybrid work environment? Uh, any thoughts you have on that? I, I kind of, uh, I, I think, yes, it should be. And and like, for example, one, I know several companies that they have uh, during orientation, one of the activities is kind of a, we're, we're going to do a scavenger hunt. We want everyone to go out and meet five people in the organization that you don't know from different levels, different functions, and come back and tell us what you learned about what they do. And wow, just like that, you're, you're assimilating them into the organization. And and uh, I thought I thought that's kind of kind of cool to to uh, make it an active process to connect with others, even as part of orientation. Certainly using recognition tools, no better way to get them going than to start in recognition. Here's some thank you notes to give to people that have helped you um, uh, acclimate to the organization, have helped you on your journey. Um, build recognition right in, into the, the get-go of, of, uh, for every new employee. Any thoughts well, you have about that? The onboarding group? process is critical because um, the metrics that I had when we surveyed employees about their onboarding experience, about almost half of the employees reported that they were not onboarded correctly that onboarding, they were not satisfied with the way they were oriented to the new company. Yeah, and I think asking about that can help you get better at it. You know, another question, probably the, the question that uh, came up the most, I, I, I got about uh, 10 people ask variations of, how do you resolve the, the virtual in-person worker divide, you know, in terms of uh, have and have nots, and some people, don't have the option to work virtually, and and uh, some people felt that it should be the same for everybody. Everyone has work, works virtually, or or no one works virtually. Um, interested in your thoughts on that? I I tend to I tend to think that uh, you, you surface the issue, you talk about the issue with the people that are affected, and come up with a solution. Uh, with you know the best management is what you do with people, not what you do to people. So don't decide in the vacuum and tell them this is how it's going to be, because you're going to you know piss off everyone but uh, instead work with them to say, here's our concern. Like, for example, someone said, well, we, we, we allow virtual work, but then we need to have the office covered because we have walk-in customers. So, well, you can delegate something or you could say, how, how does the team want to handle this? We got to have people here and, and they'll come up with something. So let's do a scheduling system and, and uh, you know, or, or some, some type that will, will cover the need of the company, of the organization. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the answer to this question is defined by the actual job description. So, for example, if I am working as a nurse in an intensive care unit at a hospital, I'm not going to be able to work from home. So, you know, that's that's predefined. But some jobs um, it, the, do not require being on site at all times. And in those cases, there should be 
a consideration for a hybrid model. And, and so if you have an a, a, a employee that is in one of those jobs and they want to be in a virtual job to work from home, then I, I say, well, this is the type of jobs that do that. This You need to work towards doing one of these jobs, which means you need to have the qualifications to do that. So this work on getting you those skills as necessary. Uh, just just randomly saying, well, you know, some people can do it, some people can't. So, I, I, you know, just like, for example, you know, if if you like to travel, there's there's some jobs that have a lot of travel, you know, and some jobs don't have any travel. So uh, naturally, if, if you want to travel, then you need to work towards a job that allows that or expects that or maybe sales or maybe whatever it might be. But uh, just to grant that or wave a wand isn't realistic. But but to be on the employee's side to say this helped get you there is realistic. And I think every manager owes that to their their employee. Um, I totally agree, Bob. So we had uh, another a bunch of questions that came up about employee engagement in, in general, not just with hybrid. Um, and I, 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 we we made some comments on on that. But anything you you want to you want to add around employee engagement and how to have people feel more engaged and, and truly uh, bringing their full self to the workplace? It's the you know they be flexible, and I obviously want to listen to them. Um, <clears throat> and do the, those ubiquitous employee engagement surveys, but most importantly, act on the results. The single greatest complaint regarding um, employee engagement surveys is nothing was done with the results. So yeah. you need to make sure that when you deliver those results to the managers and about how their workers are feeling and how engaged they are, what is really floating their boat and what is detracting from their engagement, that you hold the manager accountable for putting together a meaningful action plan within three months of when those results were given to the manager. And then one of the secrets to ensuring that there's accountability for the manager acting on the results is do the follow-up survey. Allow the employees to essentially grade the meaningfulness of their manager's survey related action plan. And you can ask two items in that post survey, which is three months after the employee survey, this company or this organization used the results uh, from the employee engagement survey to make a meaningful change. And then the same question except specific to the manager. My manager effectively used the results to the employee survey to make positive change for our work group. And that Excellent. way, the, and you let the managers know that this follow-up survey is going to happen. They're going to take it a lot more seriously because they know their manager will see those results as well. And they want to be seen as somebody that's really listening to employee uh, employee feedback. Excellent. And, and the final category of questions we got were around uh, recognition issues. And I did my doctoral dissertation on this topic and have, a, of course, a lot to say about that. And uh, but um, one of the things I thought would be relevant for this conversation is just to give some ideas for doing virtual recognition. And so let me let me just uh, charge through these, and then uh, Kevin, I'd be interested in, in your additional uh, thoughts on this as well. Um, that uh, you can do uh, online meeting callouts in any Microsoft Teams or or Zoom or or uh, go to meetings. You can. Um, you can call on somebody. You can thank them for something they did. A more systematic way, of, you can you can use uh, electronic thank you cards, uh, notes with uh, for people. Um, I one of the things I I think works really great virtually. You can also do it in person as well. But is I call it a praise barrage, and that is where you hey before we get into the agenda, uh, just take I want to take just a couple of minutes and go around our group. And as I call your name, I like other people to to call out what they most value about uh, working with you. Let's start with Tom. Okay, now Sally, now Gary. And and 10 minutes later, what, what's just happened? Everyone has gotten specific feedback about something they've done well from someone they work with. That's a positive Bob, thing. Yes. What, what if the answer to that question is complete silence? What do you do then? And then you, you, you chime in, you start off, Tom, well, Tom, I really appreciate it. When you say you're gonna do something, it, it happens. 
or, or Sally, when I, 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 I really value how you pull in the quiet person because we need to hear from them as well. Or, or Tony, you're so good at summarizing. So whatever people have been recognized for in that session, they will do a better job at. It's human nature. <laughs> this is the beauty of recognition. And, and also by the fact that you did that in a team setting, you just brought the team tighter together. They know a little bit more about each other. In fact, another version of this is just asking people, hey, everyone, everyone share two things that they like to do when they're not at work, you know, hobbies or, or pastimes. And you do that, people are going to find connections they didn't have before. So it's a, it's a simple thing. You can also do it in person, too, with index cards. Write a thank you note to someone else you owe in our group. And you get back four or five thank you cards on something you've done for others. That's going to have an impression on you. And it's going to cement that you're adding value and you're going to be even better at doing that going forward. Um, you can have, uh, you know, uh, I think it's kind of fun. I worked with Hyatt and they had, uh, they do praise buddies and me pages. What they do is they assign, it's like a secret Santa. I want you to recognize this other person on the team that's virtual. So pay attention to what they're doing and chime in when they've done a good job. Uh, and then they also, they, they start, they have everyone do a, a me page about just, here's a dozen questions about, you know, hobbies, favorite foods, uh, pets, pets names, uh, you know, family situation. Uh, and again, it just gives you fodder to get to know people better. And the more you know about people, the better you can motivate them, the better you can have them work together as a, as a team. Um, applause, electronic bulletin boards, you know, there's a lot of great, you have to use technology today. This is the big difference between now and and, and 15 years ago, technology is in place to help you better work with virtual employees. And, and uh, here's, here's one that uh, uh, WorkProud did uh, with Qualcomm. It's a, found, it's, a, it's a software platform where anyone can, can thank any other employee in the company. And there's a public, uh, a public uh, leaderboard and there's, there's it's, like a, it's like Facebook, you have, uh, you have a news feed of public recognition and then you can call out individuals or teams. It's very powerful. Not and not just for amping up the amount of recognition, but also if you're not measuring it, you're not managing it. You know, Peter Drucker said, if you if you if you aren't or if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so uh, part of the topic of recognition is to is to get your teeth into it and and uh not just randomly do here's some Starbucks gift cards and and I don't know who got them or why they got them, but you know stop by our HR if you want one kind of thing. That's kind of a waste of focus and attention, whereas you, you can systematically narrow it down to the desired performance you want uh, through the platform you have. Uh, this has worked very, very well. And and with the launch of this, the amount of recognition they did shot up like 90% in the first three months, which of course is, is was one of the things that employees want more of. You can have simultaneous celebrations. We saw this during the pandemic with People in New York and New Jersey come out at 7 p.m. every night to, to bang pots and pans to thank healthcare workers that were keeping us alive. And why did we stop doing that? We need to keep doing that because they're putting their lives at risk to, to help us. Um, another version of this, and there's lots of lots of ideas that I think is kind of fun, is like I did this with my my virtual team that I got uh, these these uh, collapsible uh, popcorn makers used in the microwave. And anytime we could say, hey, let's, let's make some popcorn and have some popcorn together. We're, we're not physically together, but we can each make popcorn. I gave all, every virtual employee one of these. I think they were $7 each from Walmart, you know. And, and now anytime we can have an instant celebration. Um, and finally, whatever you're doing, you got you to gotta review what's working, what's not working, and then, then make some changes to tweak the journey. You can't get it right just out of the chute. So that's all part of it. Uh, so identify what, how people want to be motivated, made, how long to be recognized, do at least, make sure you're doing at least what you're doing for your in-office employees, for your virtual employees, and maybe, maybe just do even more for them. Check in more often, which is a form of attention because they already feel out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and then wherever possible, follow up with, with face-to-face -face recognition. So that could be when they first start the job, like my wife was working for a job in Austin. We're we're uh, coming in Austin. We're in San Diego, and they they flew her there for a week or two to get to know the people and hear the mission and that type of thing. So to get that grounding because she's going to be working virtually for the rest of the time, uh, or, or would you have a chance to meet people personally, bring that into it. So that's there's, there's one question here uh, that I want to address from Claudia, 
And Please. it's basically for companies implementing a two-way engagement model, what can be done to help employees recognize they contribute to their own engagement. This is right out of what I created uh, for the, the missing part of engagement. It's not all about the company engaging employees. It's not all about the manager engaging employees. Employees themselves need to accept responsibility for their own engagement. And Absolutely. that's why I created a document called PEER, which is a personal employee engagement report. There are several out there, allow employees to answer survey questions, and then they get their own personal engagement report back. It shows them that they are not as engaged as they thought they were and gives them ideas on what they can do to influence their own engagement. Excellent. Excellent. And again, uh, that is the onus has shifted, I think, to employees. If you want this to work, you have to work with us and 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 to to be involved and and to tell us when it's not working and to speak up when you disagree that type of thing. So uh, that's boy, that's briefly a whirlwind of uh, some of the issues that came up. Um, again, we promised uh, anyone that asked a question before or during the session the chat that you would get a, a copy of uh, of one of each of our books pictured here. And uh, Michael's going to send out a form. That you can complete and and get and he'll he'll get that to us to send out those books and and, and just if you don't if you don't get the book or or you want a different book just email me directly and I'll I'll take care of that for you. And, and also, if any of you want um, uh, information about any of the resources I mentioned, my blogs and some of the other stuff, that's uh, my email address um, below Bob's Kevin right. at Kevin Sheridan LLC dot com. I'd be and happy this, to send you those resources. And this is a photo of, of uh, Kevin and I. Uh, we we hike hike mountains together. We're top of the highest. Uh, and actually, I got really sunburned that day. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> that was my guide, Sierra, on the highest point in Africa. That was the first of my five, seven summits. And that's me on the left holding up my ski pole. <laughs> I'm a hiker. I haven't oh. done the five summits yet or the seven summits, but uh, I'm I'm rooting for you, Kevin. All right, Michael, we'll over to you. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. We will be, you know, arranging the follow-ups in terms of collecting information for book addresses. Somebody had asked about other books. Bob was generous enough to do that, but certainly we want to thank Bob and Kevin. I want to share with everybody very briefly, this won't be the last of our webinars or content distributions on this topic. Clearly, there's a lot and a lot of opportunities to go deeper. Uh, you know, especially reading through some of the questions. I think the first question, just very briefly, Kevin, this is not going anywhere, is it? This question of remote work. Yes, no. What, what do you mean? Where will we be in two years relative to, to remote work? Like we are now, somewhere in the future, meaning must we develop strategies acknowledging the fact that remote work is not just a post COVID hangover, but will actually be part of the U.S. workplace construct. Go well, I think I think if if it works, it will it will unfold, and there'll be more of it, and for both the organizations, but also for employees. If if where you're working and they're saying, well, we're not allowing remote remote work anymore, then you got a choice to make, and and uh, for a lot of people, they got abilities and they can get another job. And if if virtual is part of the requirement then they state that up front and they will find a job that allows them to do, do virtual work. So um, I, I think we're going to see, a, as we go on, a, a sifting out of, of uh, what's working and, and people will find where they fit and companies will find what they're comfortable with as well. And right now it's all over the map and, and maybe it'll stay all over the map, but at least be cognizant in making a decision that by choice, we're, we're doing it this way. All right, Kevin, any other final message from you? Well, in the spirit of recognition, I want to thank both Dr. Bob and you, Michael, for including me in this. Uh, I hope it's not the last time. So I know we've come to the end of it, and I know there were lots of questions that didn't get answered. We will provide contact information for Bob and Kevin should you wish to engage directly with him. Written responses, opportunity for the book, and look out for uh, the next webinar, perhaps again on this topic, and we might be lucky enough to have Kevin and or Bob back again. I'm sure Bob's got one coming up, I believe, in yeah. a month. Yes, we um, do. But we'll be sending out some information on that. Kevin, thank you very, very much. And to all the attendees at home, remember, some prayers for peace around the world. Let us all get through this period of history. Amen.
and 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 hybrid work is here to stay. All the best. Thank everybody. you, Michael.